Revelation chapter 3, 14 through 22. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot or you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. So the transcripts for Philadelphia and Laodicea will be available last or next week, not last week, <laughs> next week. They'll be in the back there. And um, so if we don't get, if we're not able to cover everything today, everything that we have ahead of us for Laodicea today, um, it will be in the transcript. So don't worry, it'll be there. And uh, that'll be next week, though, after my editor, Don, gets a chance to look at it and make corrections. Uh, it'll be back and available for everybody. So again, we ended last week by examining what lukewarm might be and the various suppositions about the culture of Laodicea in that regard. Uh, but as we mentioned, I think the text gives us a bit of a clue as to what Jesus is really confronting here. And what, what I think he is speaking of with lukewarm as an illustration is he's, he's trying to make a contrast, a contrast between what Leo, Laodicea thinks they are and what he knows them truly to be. So what I believe is the struggle of the Laodicean church, if we can narrow it down into three words, it would be deluded religious self-righteousness. All right? Because there's a non-religious self-righteousness, but this is deluded religious self-righteousness. All right? So they have convinced themselves that they are far better off than they are. And so lukewarm, the lukewarm are those who claim to be religious, they claim to love God. They claim that they're a good person. They're satisfied with themselves. They're satisfied with religion and feel no need to rock the boat with the messiness of discipleship. All right. The hot, the hot can't get enough of God. They're hungry for God. They're hungry for the Lord in their life. And they're, they're zealous for, for God. And, and they're not perfect. But they are hungry to grow, hungry to go further with God, to obey God, to walk with God. The cold don't know God. They're unaware of who he is and his love for them and the life that he has for them. The lukewarm are those who are satisfied and they're comfortable and they're complacent. Boy, those sound like three wonderful words, don't they? Comfortable satisfied well complacent doesn't sound so good but comfortable and satisfied those sounds just like a warm blanket you know and and the lukewarm are, are like those who are sitting on a couch you ever sit on a couch and you know you got things to do <laughs> you know you got stuff that needs to happen but that couch is just so comfortable and you just don't want to get up but what happens if you just sit there you can't get up. <laughs> the longer you sit, the harder it is to get up, right? And and uh, if you take that pattern on day after day after day, it gets harder and harder and harder to get on the move, to keep yourself healthy. Actually, health takes work. Sure. Right? Um, notice something, though, about what's going on here. Notice that the lukewarm, those who have just enough religion or righteousness to be satisfied with themselves, the lukewarm never see themselves as lukewarm. And this is the problem with Laodicea. They're self-righteous. They're self-satisfied. Francis Chan tells a story about 
his passion and his his exuberance for the Lord, his zeal for the Lord. And he was he was a pastor of a large church in, in, in California. And a few years before he felt called out of that church, one of his church members, an influential church member, came up and, and was rebuking him after one of his messages. And he says, you know, the problem with you, Francis, is that is that you know you only see things one way. For you, there's there's only a narrow road. There's only this narrow road. There's either your narrow road or there's the wide road for the, what, for the rest of the world. But there's, Francis, there's, there's also a middle road. <laughs> and Francis says, well, well I, I didn't know that. You know, I read, I read in the Bible that there's a wide road that leads to destruction and there's a narrow road that leads to salvation. But now, now there's this middle road where you can just be as lukewarm as you want. Christianity is something that's under, to, totally under your control. Don't get too excited about this God thing. And just take the middle road. Boy, we see that in modern Christianity. The middle road, the lukewarm, the self-righteous, self-deceived road is absolutely the most dangerous. A non-Christian can be on the wide road and hear from the Lord and be radically saved. The, the person in the, in the narrow road is following Jesus and, and things can go wrong in their life and their life can be shipwrecked, but they always have Jesus and they have victory and power. But that person in the middle road, their ears grow deaf to the voice and the call of their Savior. When the Christian is on the middle road, they lose their urgency, their fervor for seeing the kingdom grow and souls saved. They become complacent and comfortable, passionate, only about maintaining the status quo. While those God passionately loves, those called those he has called the Christian to shine the light for, light to shine the light before. People all around that lukewarm Christian are living and dying in darkness. That's what's so dangerous. See, the, the middle road, the lukewarm road, is not just dangerous for the one on it. It's dangerous for everybody who sees them, everybody who encounters them. But it's really comfortable. In that middle road, we get people, we get things, we hear things like, but we've always done it that way. A Christian can flirt with the comfortable thinking of that middle road and be blinded to their own need for discipleship and while on that road be of no use whatsoever for the kingdom. The middle road is the comfortable couch. So moving on to verse 17, Jesus says, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered and need nothing. See what I'm talking about? About the self-delusion. And I need nothing, not realizing that you're a wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and, and naked. See, here we see the great contrast between how the Laodicean Christians saw themselves and how Jesus saw them. And this ought to bring some measure of consternation to all of us, to the mind of every Christian. We need to be asking ourselves, is our measure of ourselves, as much as we can perceive, is our measure of ourselves in harmony with the Lord's measurement of us? That's a tough question. Is our measurement of us of ourselves in harmony with the Lord's. The Laodiceans, for the Laodiceans, it was not. Another question, are we continually available and willing and vulnerable to his, to his measure of correction and discipline? The Laodiceans thought they had the measure of themselves. They were wrong. This isn't the only group of self-righteous people that Jesus confronts. In his ministry, take a look at Luke 8, 18, chapter 9 through 14. He also told this parable of, of those who trusted him in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes 
of all I get. But, to, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. When we read of Laodicea and this parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, we need to be on guard against the very nature and the very same attitude of the Pharisees. We do that a lot. We look at the Pharisees in Scripture and we say, we say, boy, I'm sure glad I'm not like those Pharisees. Just like the Pharisees saying, boy, I'm sure glad I'm not like that tax collector. We also need to remember that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Jesus does not continually we need to understand that Jesus does not continually point out the dark hearts of the Pharisees or even the Laodiceans. He doesn't do it to shame them. He does it to save them. The, their self-righteousness is keeping them lukewarm in their response to God. It is keeping them trapped. And he wants them freed. So this word we talked about last week, spit, that word is expulse or vomit or just the idea is to remove it to get it out and spitting or vomiting is the idea of something being expelled from the body but even such an expulsion can be good for the one being expelled we don't necessarily see that right away when we first look at this passage we don't see jesus is doing it for their good but i want to this isn't the only case where jesus talks about getting someone out or where the word the bible talks about getting someone out we see it as we mentioned in, in when, as when, when we were looking at other churches we see paul do, doing the same thing with the man who is sleeping with his father's wife in the church in corinth he says expel the immoral brother but why so that his soul might be saved Explosion is not, when we read of it in scripture, it's not like we see in Hollywood, like the, like the pilgrims, the nasty, mean pilgrims, excommunicating the people from the sinner from their midst and everybody turning their back on them, putting a red letter on them and just getting them away from them because they don't want to be associated with them. That's, that's not what we're talking about here. This is a removal of this person from the body so that they may be saved so that they might come to their senses, so that they might repent, so that they might be restored, all right? It's a last ditch effort to bring the stubbornly unrepentant to repentance for restoration. It is a removal of fellowship, a purposeful removal from the protection of God upon a person so that they might come to their senses and repent and be restored. And we read in, in 2 Corinthians that that's exactly what happened. The man was restored. He was brought back to the body of Christ. So if this is the goal of the expulsion we see in 1 Corinthians, then perhaps what Jesus is saying here is for the same purpose. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. He didn't say he did yet. He says he's about to. But perhaps this would be for the same purpose, to bring repentance. You know, discipline in the church or discipline of the church always has a twofold purpose. It's for the sake of the one disciplined, for the sake of the one rebuked, and it's also for the sake of the witness of the church. The world is watching. Verse 17 Again, I want to read that again. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. So these Laodiceans, they did not understand their own selves, their own state, their own predicament. There's a lack of self-examination that leads to self-deception and self-righteousness. I want to tell you, if there's ever been an age where this attitude has been more present around the world and even in the church, I don't know of one. I don't know of a time where this attitude of diluted self-righteousness has been more common in society. 
I see it tremendously. There is this growing amount of self-expression out there. And along with this exploding self-expression, there is an imploding self-examination. And we need to be afraid of that. We need to run away from that. Self-examination is difficult. It's hard. But the one who really loves the Lord is not going to be a stranger to it. The Lord doesn't leave them there in their self-righteousness. In verse 18, we see the Lord's gracious invitation to these lukewarm ones. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire so that you may be rich. Buy from me. That's an interesting phrase, but it's very appropriate. God's love for us and grace towards us, the work of the cross and the salvation that is wrought are free. God has paid the price. And so it's strange for us to read, buy from me. But those who receive this, who receive the free gift of salvation, must receive God as he is. Those who are saved are not saved into new life in Christ, not in themselves. Oh, those who are saved are saved into new life in Christ. They're not saved into life in themselves. They don't get to define what this new life looks like. Those who are saved are saved unto God. And so salvation is a free gift, but the giver designs the gift, not the recipient. That's something I think we miss when it comes to salvation. We think, we think well, you know, there's, it's free gift. There's no works involved. And so someone might get saved. And then, you know, what, what, their, what their spiritual life looks like is up to them. No. When I get saved, when you get saved, when we get saved, when we give our lives to God, when we receive the gift of salvation, we're not receiving a gift that we have designed. We're receiving Jesus as he is. Now, let me explain where I'm going with that. Because we're receiving Jesus as he is, true salvation results in a, in a desire to grow closer to Christ, to become more like he is. And that costs. The cost we pay for our new life in Christ is our old life. This is not a work, it's a release. It's a letting go. It's a trade-in. And so Jesus is saying, give me your false self-righteousness. Give me your fool's gold. Give me your self-deception. Give me your worldly idea of wealth and security and power. Lay them down on my feet and exchange, I'm going to give you true riches. Refined by fire, this points to the crucible of suffering for the gospel, for all those who truly follow Christ. And all those who truly follow Christ are going to suffer. It is through the hard times, through the refining that we grow the most that our character is refined and made more like Jesus. And it's, it's something, too, to think about with these Laodiceans that are so successful and so prosperous, it, that when they pass through the fire and are refined, when all of us pass through the fire and are refined, we are made more like Jesus, and more and more we increasingly realize that all we need, everything we really need, is not found in worldly riches or worldly influence, all we need, rather, is in Christ. He is the pure gold. And everything else, when, goes through, when it goes through the fire, is revealed to be less than him. And then Jesus says, And white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. So another glorious part of this great exchange is his pure white garments for our filthy rags. As the father put the best robe on his return prodigal son, so Jesus desires to clothe us with his very own clothes of royalty, 
purity, and power. Isaiah 61 verse 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with beautiful headdress, as a bridegroom adorns herself, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. And Jesus goes on and he says, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. See, the Laodiceans thought they had a measure of things. They thought that they were wise. John chapter 9, verse 35 through 41, Jesus says, Jesus heard they had cast him out, and having found um, him, he said to the blind man he just healed, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the blind man, and the blind man answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe him? And Jesus said to him, You have seen him. It is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. As we have already discussed, the greatest danger of self-righteousness is self-delusion. Self-righteousness, the self-righteous think that they are something they're not. They're blind to their own sin. They're blind to their own inaccurate assessment of reality. That's a huge one. They're blind to their own inaccurate assessment of reality. They are blind to their own inaccuracy when it comes to judging situations and judging people. I see that all over the place, man. When it comes to how we see everything that comes to us on, on the internet, on news or whatever, and how we judge situations, how we judge culture, how we judge people, we so much can easily fall into this and think, I'm right. My, my understanding and my estimation of the situation and of people is the right one. Without ever bothering to see what the scripture has to say. And so we fall right into this same trap. The Lord desires, however, that they may see the truth and be set free. Just a quick way to measure if you have been blinded by self-righteousness, ask yourself, your righteousness, your measure of what is right and wrong, what you stand for, what you promote, how you think of the world and other people, how you treat other people or family or friends or neighbors, where does that all come from? If it comes from anything other than a careful humble, transformative study of the word of God, then your chances of being caught up in self-righteousness are much, much higher. We need to see the Lord. We need, to, we need the Lord in order to see. He is the amen, as Brother Jeff said. He is the truth. And anything that comes out of us, isn't that amazing that Jesus is the amen? And so therefore, anything that comes out of us that does not mesh with the amen is what? If it's not truth, what is it? It's error. It might be outright lie, but it's at the very least error. If, if anything comes out of us, if it doesn't measure up with Jesus, that doesn't look like Jesus, is error. Anything that we believe that we keep internally about ourselves or other people that doesn't measure up with the amen is error. Verse 19, Jesus says, those whom I love, I reprove, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Man, we need to remember this verse. All these verses are so good. Jesus says, those whom I love, I repu reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. There's just a couple of things I want to note about that. Firstly, the beautiful reminder of our Lord and his love. And in that is the instruction that the Lord's estimation of love is indeed far different from our own. 
we mistakenly often believe and even teach that to love is to embrace forbearance and forsake discipline. That's what we think. That's what the world thinks. Love is the embracing of forbearance and tolerance and the forsaking of discipline. But the Lord's love, true, actual, real love, is not absent of both grace and correction. Indeed, the Lord's grace and love is in his discipline. They cannot be separated. True love is always for the good of the beloved, even if they don't perceive it as the good. Any parent understands this. Anyone with a, that's really a true friend understands this. The word reprove here in the Greek is eleg cho, and it means to expose the wrongness of or to rebuke. So when we are reproved or when we feel like we are being reproved, because sometimes we're not really being reproved, we just feel like we are. When we are reproved or when we feel like we are reproved, how do we respond? We typically, we resist, right? That's the first thing that comes up. When we're corrected, when we're reproved, when we're rebuked, we resist. We balk, we run, we hide. Perhaps we strike back at the one who dared to, to love us so. <laughs> because we think reproof is unloving and unkind. We've been taught that. And sometimes, you know, it is. Sometimes it's done in an unloving and unkind way because it's done by fallen humans. But oftentimes, even when it's done lovingly and kindly and gently, though just a side note, I think our understanding of the word gentleness needs to also come under biblical authority. I don't think it is. I hear that all the time, the word gentle tossed around when, and it's not, it's, it's understood in a, in a human fleshly way and it's not understood biblically what that is. Um, so anyway, even when reproof and correction comes our way, gently, graciously, even when it's done rightly, we often fight it. But this is the Lord's kind of love for us. Let me make this perfectly clear. This is, this is the selfless love of God that works for the good of the beloved, regardless of the one who is loved, or how, regardless of how the one who is loved in this way might react to this love. This is the kind of love that wants what's best for them and is going to do whatever it takes. We often make another mistake when we read verses like this and think, okay, well, phew. Well, that's for God to discipline like that, not for me. God's going to do it. So I don't have to. God's going to take care of it, so I don't need to. I don't need to correct or rebuke or reprove anyone. I don't need to hold people accountable, especially the church. But Paul said, for what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church who you are to judge? So the love of the Lord displays for us, as we see here, and we see manifest by the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, is a self-sacrificial love that will say the difficult thing from the word of God that needs saying. And once the difficult thing has been said, it will come alongside the person who has been reproved and will offer itself as burden bearer and supporter in the process of growth and healing and accountability. The Lord never reproves us and washes his hands of us. Praise God for that. He never says, I'm corrected. I corrected you. I'm done with you. He reproves us to restore us. And that's why lukewarmness is such a problem. Because it deafens us to the very voice of God. And then he says, so be zealous. Jesus' exhortation here seems to be, seems indeed to give credence to the commentators that say the rebuke of lukewarmness is for those, is about zeal. Surely the fire of the love for the Lord has grown cold in this church. And Jesus makes it clear here that he is not pleased with 
faith that lacks zeal. God has never been satisfied with religious practices that lack heart and commitment. Listen to this passage from Isaiah, and there are many others like it in Lamentations and Jeremiah and Amos. Hear the words of the Lord, Isaiah 1. You rulers of Sodom, listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What good to me is, is your multitude of sacrifices, says the Lord. I am full from the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed cattle. I take no delight in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you appear before me, who has required this of you, this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no more. Your incense is detestable, detestable to me. Your new moons, Sabbaths, and convocations. I cannot endure iniquity in a solemn assembly. I hate your new moons and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you multiply your prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash and cleanse yourself. Remove your evil deeds from my sight. Stop doing evil and learn to do right. The Lord isn't pleased by religious ceremony without love for him. Everything we do in worship to him has to come from love for him that is reflected in our life. Why does God desire this type of faith? Because he's a God of relationship. He's not sterile. He's not into sterile, self-deluding ceremony. The, the church of Laodicea probably had plenty of that. Sterile, self-deluding ceremony. This is the kind of love that God demonstrates for us is the kind of love that is zealous for us, that is jealous for us, that is passionate about us, that wants to walk with us, wants to live in us, wants to have everyday fellowship with us. It's not about all these traditions that we surround ourselves with. Not to say that they're bad. But a real relationship with God is so much more than that. And so we know this zeal, this joyful, steadfast, willing, willingly, wholehearted commit to God is woefully lacking in the life of Laodicean Christians. And it's lacking today. We live in the age of monotheistic therapeutic deism. And that is the age where if you believe in God, even in church, that's the most common type of belief that people have. That sees God as a comforter that can be put in our pocket and brought out whenever we need to feel good. And not really considered when not needed. That's not what God wants for his people or from his people. He wants our love. He wants our hearts. And so look at, look at this next verse. And this is a very famous verse that we all know. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Where is Jesus in the location in this picture? Where is he? In relation to the house of Laodicea, where is he? Outside. He's outside. Their religious self-righteousness, self-deluded self-righteousness has pushed him out. And so he's knocking to come into his own house. He's standing on the outside. He desires entry. They have shut him out. But notice the individual language here. These are letters to the angels and the churches they represent. They're to bodies of Christians. But here again, as he does in all the letters, Jesus brings it down to individual commitment. He says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him. Singular. Hear that individual emphasis that he's putting there. That individual who hears the knock of the Lord, who hears the Lord asking for entry, and, and opens and receives him, to that one, Jesus will come in and have fellowship. And he goes on in verse 21. He says, to the one who conquers, I will grant 
him to sit with my father on his throne. And again, we see the Lord promises shared rule. We see that mentioned over and over and over again. The result of being the adopted son or daughter of the king, we are co-heirs with Christ. So how did the Laodiceans conquer? They repent. They allow Christ to come in to where he should have been the whole time. The center of their life. They allow him to come in and show him that he show them that he is the amen. He is the truth. They have been believing and walking in lies. They cannot conquer so long as in so long as they stay in their defeat. They cannot conquer. So long as they already think of themselves as rich, they cannot truly be rich. So long as they already think of themselves as righteous, they cannot truly experience the righteousness of God in their life. They cannot conquer so long as they're as in their defeat they see themselves as victors. They have to abandon their own estimations of who they are and take on his. He is the Amen. So what happened to Laodicea historically? In AD 161, one of the bishops of Laodicea, his name was Sagar, was martyred for the faith. In AD 363, Laodicea was chosen chosen by the Church of Asia Minor to be a location for a very important council of the church. So you see, just like in Sardis, when God rebuked the church of Laodicea in Sardis and they repented, we saw that 1,400 years later, they were still around. And so with the same story with Laodicea. Because they received the reproof and rebuke and the discipline of the Lord. And God restored them and brought them to where he wanted them to be. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Remember what we saw when we first examined what this phrase really meant. Yes, there is an element of being receptive in this phrase, but it's also, but also remember that this is, that by this the Lord is also saying, If you can hear, if you have ears, or if you can read, or if this is read to you, this is for you. And so we we often hear that in messages, we we read it in devotionals, we go, I wonder if this is for me. Yes! That's what the Lord is saying. If you can hear it, if you can read it, it's for you. Receive what the Spirit is saying to you. I'm reminded real quickly, just a quick story from my personal life that relates to this and what the Lord is doing in Laodicea. Being ordained in the Wesleyan Church is is an arduous journey. I made it more arduous than most guys. It's just because I I always do things the difficult way, it seems. And so what usually takes guys five to six years, I turn into a 13-year journey. Um... And over all those years, a couple times a year, I would sit be, 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 uh, in front of this council of pastors in the area, and they would grill me. Not only was it that grilling every year to make sure I'm right uh, as far as holy living and theologically and growing in my understanding of the word of God, of God and my commitment to the church and to the Lord, Not only that, but also there was a ton of education that had to happen. I graduate with two bachelors, a minor, and a concentration. And I find out I'm nowhere close to done in order to be ordained. And so I had to go through all this other education on top of that. And it's an arduous journey. And so I come before these guys and reproof is part of the 
part, part of the deal. Rebu rebuke is part of the deal. And you know, I, I can't, I'd love to be able to tell you that everybody that goes through the process makes it through. That's not the truth. I had some friends that I knew loved the Lord and wanted to go into ministry that when reproof came their way, they walked out the door. I've seen it firsthand. God calls someone to work for him, to live for him, to serve him. As he calls all of us. And when the church comes along and says, hey, there's this area in your life that's got to go. Whether it be a practice or an attitude or a heresy, there's this area that the Holy Spirit has revealed to us and the Word of God has revealed to us that needs to be crucified. More times than not, I've seen people get up and walk away. That's not the will of God for his church, for his people. He wants to give us life and life abundant, but that is only achieved on the other side of the cross. The empty tomb is on the other side of the cross. Freedom from everything that we're wrestling with, whether it be attitude or heresy, is on the other side of the cross. Is on the other side of us receiving the real truth about us and about our Lord. And so that comes to all of us. The question is, are we going to respond like Sardis did? Are we going to respond like Laodicea did? Like history shows they did? Or will we instead settle for so much less? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you love us that much. That you never close the book on us. You never rebuke and walk away. But that your desire is to restore us. We thank you that we see your heart in these letters to your people. That we see you reaching out to them. Offering so much more than what they are satisfied with. So teach us, Lord, to be satisfied with nothing less than you. To find in you our gold, our white robes, and our sight. Have your will and your way in us, Lord, regardless of what that takes and what that means. Have your will and your way in us. In, and I mean this for all of us individually, Lord. Have your will and your way in me. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone.